everybody, and welcome back to Beware the Artist. I am Jeremy Jersa, and with us this week, we have Caleb Cordacrax. Uh, Caleb, if you want to tell us a little bit about who you are and what is it that you do. Sure. Uh, thanks for having me on, Jeremy. Uh, so, yeah, my name's Caleb. I'm a painter primarily, and I've been uh, painting and teaching since, well, been teaching since uh, 2014, really, uh, in university level, but Otherwise, I've been painting for about a decade now, I would say. I started painting when I was about 20, 21. Uh, that's when I started really seriously painting. But from a young age, I was really into art. If you had asked me what I was going to do when I was like four or five, I would have totally said I was an artist. And then around the time I was like maybe seven or eight years old not enough people had told me that uh you're gonna be poor and you can't actually do that practically so then i thought i was gonna be something else and um yeah sometime around college i was like really into music and thought i was going to be studying music technology and voice and uh, i was playing uh learning the upright bass to go study and then realized that i didn't want to do that it was like last minute change i had uh, been pretty far involved in uh, doing a few other majors. I switched majors like crazy. <laughs> and, uh, and then I finally was like, I'm going to study art history. That's what I thought I was going to study. And um, I had a professor who uh, was just an amazing professor and challenged me uh, when I was transferring to Valparaiso University from Purdue that um, I was like, telling them, oh yeah, I like to paint, I like to draw. This is at like the entrance transition interview, not interview, but like orientation. Yeah, yeah. And, and he was like, I told him that, oh, I would love to take some painting and drawing classes because I really love to paint, I love to draw, and I think I have a natural like um, inclination or ability for it, so I just like to do that. And then he just like squarely put it to me, he said, um, this is uh, Bob Serko is his name, he said, um, why would you study the history of art if you could make art? Mm. And he just like said it so matter of factly, and he felt like he pierced my soul <laughs> when he said it. And so he was like, I'm gonna sign you up for some painting and drawing classes this semester and tell me what you think at the end of it. So after that, I was like immediately hooked. I just was so in love with those studio classes and I had a really awesome professor, Sarah Jancy. And she just totally helped me fall in love with painting. She, um, she really challenged me also to paint from life. Mm -hmm. she, I was painting from photographs a lot and she, she was like, no, you gotta experience like the process of painting from life. And uh, it's, it's a, an experience. And so that was, that just, I immediately was hooked. I loved it so much. So I yeah, absolutely that's a little love bit. that. I love that. There's it, it always comes down to kind of one conversation almost. I feel like in, in most artists' lives where it just sticks with them and then it kind of puts them on a whole new trajectory. That's such a great moment. Um, oh, yeah. So in, in terms of your work, um, what themes are you really exploring in your studio practice? Yeah, so gosh, honestly, it hasn't changed that much since I started <laughs> just saying that, like uh, painting perceptually and really exploring um, uh, the sort of subjective reality of uh, being, uh, being a human and being able to see things and um, having an image in your mind. Like we, we look around, we're talking to each other right now and mm -hmm. I can see you, my mind's like encoding this information into my brain. And like I have, where is the image happening in, inside of my head? That's, that's really fascinating to me, the whole human perception. And I think, um, I, I think that it really uh, started a little bit earlier in my life. When I was around 11, I was shot in the eye with a Red Ryder BB gun oh when I was 11 God. years old by a friend of mine. <laughs> Literally, uh, and it, it was, this is so ridiculous. My uncles called me Ralphie for years <laughs> before this happened because I looked, I looked like um, the, the childhood actor, uh, what's his name, uh, from A Christmas Story, yeah, Ralphie, yeah. Who, the, who played Ralphie. And so my uncles, they had been calling me that. Well, like prophecy fulfilled, I was shot in the eye with a Red Ryder BB gun. My friend shot me. I didn't shoot myself. So, yeah. but... 
uh, yeah, I couldn't see out of one eye for nearly a whole year. Oh my god! And um, did you have like yeah, an my, eye patch and everything? Oh yeah, yeah, it was nuts. <laughs> Uh, my eye looked really disturbing. I won't go into details, but uh, it, it it looked bad enough that they couldn't tell if the, the BB had gone into my eye or ricocheted off. I'll leave it at that. So um, so that I couldn't see out of my eye for nearly a year, but my vision came back. Uh, I can see out of both eyes. I wear contacts. My, my vision is pretty awful, to be honest. But I, um, yeah, so my vision came back. But after that, man... I really appreciated depth perception and yeah. like being able to catch something that someone threw at you, <laughs> just like really simple things that I totally took for granted. Mm -hmm. And it also really, um, I think once I started painting, that's when it, it really clicked for me where I, I realized how weird human vision is, especially the binocular nature of it, like that we have two eyes mm -hmm. and whatever we're not focusing on, like things behind what our plane of focus is on or things in front of are like doubled. Yeah. And um, I, I played with that a little bit early on. So this is, this is kind of like talking about my, my deep rooted love of, of vision and painting, but things that I've been exploring lately, I think have a lot still to do with um, perception and uh, organizing a space in a square. I'm really fascinated with that. And, uh, and I would say in the last like three or four years, um, color, like really, um, really indulging in color has been a huge thing for me where before that, all of my work, I, I think I had this attraction to color that I was trying to suppress and sort of nuance more and like challenge myself to like find color in darkness or find color in, um, in, in weird environments. And I, I realized like, I couldn't get away from just wanting to have some just really punchy saturated color in paintings. And for me, I think that came from like when I was a teenager, I was or actually not even just a teenager. I was really into punk music growing up. I still enjoy listening to punk music and was really into skateboarding and, and whatnot. So that, kind of culture of uh the art the art culture that goes along with that i was totally uh just naturally attracted to it so like neon bright colors and lots of neutrals sort of colliding into this weird thing and and for me i that uh that's i've been embracing that myself a lot more lately and weirdly enough finding it all over art history so looking back at paintings, like uh, I've been really digging Fra Angelico lately just because the way he like will have these super bright color notes like scattered throughout a painting. It looks like a skateboard deck or something or like a, uh, I don't, it just, it feels like some weird textile or something right, that somebody yeah. would wear today. You know, it's just bright and in your face, these like color notes that are just lovely, like not lovely, they're lovely and <laughs> just so satisfying to look at. So, um, yeah, so color has been a huge thing for me too lately. Yeah. And, uh, the figure has always been a big thing for me and I don't I'm trying to figure out how to do that still. Like, what do you do with the figure right now? But I love, I love the figure and, and painting. Um, it's, it's funny that you bring up, uh, you know, these references of color throughout art history. Um, when I was studying abroad in Florence, I had the opportunity to go to Rome and see the Sistine Chapel. And as they're looking at the ceiling, um, they had just finished cleaning it. So all of this oh. soot and everything had just been yeah. peeled off. And I'm looking up at the yeah. ceiling and I'm just like, wow, this shot silk is just, it's so vibrant and it's just coming out at you. It's its almost more mannerist than it is Renaissance. And it, it oh, has- yeah such a uh you know contemporary feeling with the use of these colors so i, I love that you're relating mm. that back to you know your skateboarding culture that bringing that that comparison i think that's really exciting um yeah so when you actually begin a painting what what is that process for you how do you go about starting that 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 journey yeah oh man that's a uh for me it's really complicated because i think i'm working on a few different bodies of work mm -hmm. and um I would say uh, I've transitioned quite a bit into doing these sort of 
I guess uh, using photography and pieces of paper, almost like a collage sort of build, building a little sculptural space that has sort of literal space from the uh, like maquette, whatever you mm -hmm. want to call it. And then um, sort of figurative space or uh, abstract space from like a photograph, you know, it's like uh, it, it's the idea of space and, and something flat. And so having those two things collide and create attention. So I, I play around a lot with just loose materials and like on a flat table, like organizing them and playing with color palettes. And uh, I've, I've been using a lot of like iPhone photography and making printouts of random photos that I realized that I took for, you know, maybe just an instinctual reason. I'll take a photograph of uh, one of my girls, one of my daughters, or my wife, or somebody, or if, uh, just random things throughout the day that are attractive to me. And it, it I don't, I, I think in that way, it's a lot, that's like the intuitive part of the photography. I'm not exactly thinking, oh, I'm going to make a painting out of this. But then I'll, sometimes you're just sitting looking at old photos, and I'm like, that, that painting, uh, or that, that could be a painting, mm -hmm. like, I just see it. And so then I start playing around with it that way. Um, otherwise, I had been working on a series over the last two, three years that uh, I've been titling just Passage, Passage 1, Passage 2, and going on and on. And that, for me, was a totally different experiment. It was um, playing around mostly with colors in a sort of predetermined composition slightly predetermined. Like I found this composition through uh, doing a lot of work around 2017 that was going towards a show that I was gonna be, uh, that I, uh, a show that I had called um, Ghost of the Host. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. what I, I called that show um, at uh, Stevenson University. And so I, I came across this composition in one of those paintings and I loved it and I, kept doing it over and over and trying out new color palettes on it. And it all revolved around this idea of a doorway or a window or sort of opening into a space. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So, uh, uh, gosh, am I, am I actually answering the question? How do I start? But those <laughs> are kind of like ideas that are bouncing around for me. Uh, a lot of times too, it might just be old paintings I'm looking at and uh, not my own, but historical paintings. So, for me, I really feel like uh, I want, I, I don't want my paintings to be a sort of rejection of what came before. I, um, and maybe this is a generational thing. Like, uh, you know, I look at the, the painters from the boomer generation and I, I'm like really upset by their attitudes. I get it and I, I understand them, but I'm also just like, man, you threw out the baby with the bathwater kind of thing, <laughs> you know? So, I, uh, I, I think it, that I, I, while I understand why a lot of painters wanted to totally like reject everything and start fresh, um, I think it, it's an, a little bit impossible and trying to do that created a lot of work that was maybe undercooked, but a lot of great work. Like I love, love a lot of like mid-century painting or paintings from seventies and eighties and whatnot, but, uh. Yeah. So, so anyways, I, I really see my paintings or I want them to feel kind of tethered to different pieces of the history of painting. And I, I like that idea, the sort of passing on of the baton and standing on the shoulders of past generations, because I couldn't possibly come up with the sort of compositions that I just take for granted without all of this work of like, tons of past generations so yeah um so i want to talk about those passage paintings for a moment um because i feel like there there's there's so much um going on there you have this element of trump Louis, you have this element of depth um and then mm -hmm. that that passage that you're actually going through you're entering into the piece or the kind of void that's created inside um does that have anything further for you other than just that kind of illusion of space yeah, yeah. Um, 
I mean, I do keep it open. I don't have an exact idea in mind, but for me, I, I would probably think of it as this, uh, where my mind goes when I look at those is thinking about the sort of, um, the imminent and the transcendent experience of being a human. Mm -hmm. Like we have bodies and we're like physical and we operate in a physical world, but at the same time, we have this imagination that's just like running wild constantly and thinking about things maybe from this world, but maybe also thinking about things that we really don't quite understand. So there's this sort of, um, there's two modes of operation happening, this sort of like transcendent, you could call it spiritual mode of operation. And then this very uh, terrestrial, like touch um, and tangible thing in a painting. And so those passageways could be a sort of, um, I guess, a metaphor for that, or, or some some sort of parallel to where you're you're entering into maybe another reality, but it's contained by a physical thing that you could grasp. Mm -hmm. And I, that's like totally not. <laughs> it's it's not in the painting. I'm like talking about this. It's something that I would just project onto my own right, work, yeah. and I'm thinking about. Um, but that's where my mind goes with it. That's kind of where the work is being generated from for me. Yeah. And I think there's there's such a, a nice kind of playful element to it as well. Um, I'm, I'm thinking specifically about one piece where you, you have kind of waves that are in front of one of these void spaces. Um, yeah. <laughs> so how, how did yeah. that happen? Oh, gosh. Uh, that was actually like me just straight up copying... Um, these waves from a baptismal font in a Romanesque uh, book of hours or a Psalter or something from England that I saw. And I just was like super into the weird way that they depicted water. And so <laughs> I just was like, I want to make a painting about this strange water that I found. I, I don't even remember what book it was in. It was, it was definitely some English book, some, some Psalter or something from the Romanesque period which I love. I really, really adore Romanesque art. It's so mm -hmm. goofy, especially the stuff that came out of like England, because I, I, I actually don't know if this is the correct narrative, but this is what I tell myself is that they were landlocked, these like English artists. And there are a lot of monks and whatnot looking, looking to the East at um, what was happening in the Byzantine East and like hearing about it, but maybe not seeing much of it. And then trying to do that. <laughs> so it's like totally a weird version of like Byzantine art. And so, so for me, I just love it. It's goofy the ways that the figures are abstracted. And the, uh, the one thing though that I think is exquisite about that work is the, the way the compositions are organized and the way the space is like shallow. Mm -hmm. But it's also um, very deep at times. It feels like the illusion is very deep. So it's, uh, yeah, I can't quite like lock it down culturally. It feels, it feels like a, a weird collision of Eastern and Western art in my mind. So I, I, I'm pretty fascinated by that. And the color palettes that they used are lovely, especially you see some of these like the St. Albans Psalter or something that the colors were preserved pretty well from just being in these books that are these manuscripts that are closed mm -hmm. and you get these just really vibrant colors again like colors that feel shocking we think of older art and we think of these sort of like muddy colors which you know like the boomers like to uh, yeah. <laughs> sorry sorry boomers i'm not i don't hate you all but they you know that generation love to make fun of like all oh, these muddy gross mixtures paintings and mm -hmm. making fun of like rembrandt and crap which i just find so ironic and bizarre but uh anyways I, I think that a lot of old painting was super like indulgent with color. And so I, I liked that too. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I notice a lot in your kind of earlier works, you have this, uh, the grid almost is, is left in that observational tool of the grid. Um, how did that mm -hmm. come about in those paintings? Gosh, yeah. Oh man, I haven't done that in a little while. Um, so I was looking at... Uh, which painter was that um uh antonio mancini was it yeah who was doing he used this grid structure so uh 
I was looking at his work. I saw some of his work. Uh, well, one of one of my favorite paintings at the Art Institute is uh, his painting called Resting, I believe is the name of it. But it's this woman um, laying back and there's these like medicine, medicine bottles on a on a nightstand next to her on, and she's laying on a bed. But the grid is really obvious. So the way he did it, he had these two frames strings, uh, like open an open frame with strings being strung vertically, horizontally and diagonally at weird angles that kind of corresponded to what he was looking at. And then he would have that exact same grid on the painting, like physically pressed up against the surface of the painting. He's painting over top of these strings. And then once he did this sort of translation of one to the other, he'd pull the strings off of the painting and it would leave these scars on the surface. And I loved, I loved that in the process because it, it, to me as a young painter and I was looking at that, it just felt so generous at the time. I was like, man, he's like totally being vulnerable with his process. And in so doing, it just like makes my imagination go crazy when I look at it because I just, am, I'm, I'm there with him. I feel like I'm making the painting too, just by looking at it. And for me, I love that. And so uh, it also tied a bit into my uh, sort of, I, I don't know what you call it, obsession with perception and this idea of vision. Mm -hmm. And so for me, that started in grad school. I was looking at a lot of um, painters like that, looking looking at uh, Durer's grid, the, I, I guess it was a woodblock or an etching that he mm -hmm. did of, he, he has his eye up to the, the tip of a candle. And then he's looking through a grid at like either a figure or there's the one with a mandolin or some kind of lute instrument that he's looking at. And I was like, that's, that's awesome. It's kind of like this uh, locked, locked in position of the, the viewer and the whole, there's the grid that kind of unfolds in front of you. And it, you just kind of translate the information. So in once in one way, I loved the system of it. And uh, so I started using that for doing observational paintings when I was in grad school. And then that uh, continued for a while. I was using it actually at the beginning of those really bright, colorful paintings that I was doing about three years ago when I started doing it. I was using a more open grid, like a three by three grid. But um, yeah, I love. I I really liked that process. It for me, it kind of tied into a few things. I growing up, I had to always get my eyes checked for like early cataracts, especially in the eye that was injured. So they told me like, oh, you could, all these problems could happen with your vision. So get your eyes checked like twice a year. And I, I at the doctor's office or at, at an optometrist or wherever you get your eyes checked, you put your head into this big like mechanism and you have, there's this chin rest. You're like looking through this, all this stuff. I thought about that actually when I was in grad school, like, oh, there's this chin rest that like locks your vision, locks your, your position in. And I thought, oh, I could do that with like a tripod. And so I use a tripod, the post of the mm -hmm. tripod, and I would set it up and I would put my chin on that. And that's where I would always look at, I would look through the grid from that vantage point. So I had this very like fixed station point, you could call it. Yeah. And so that's how the process unfolded for me. And I had the two grids, uh, did the exact same process as Antonio Mancini. So that's brilliant. I love that. I, I, I love see, thinking about seeing you locking your chin in and then moving to the painting, <laughs> locking your chin in, yeah. moving back and forth. I think that's, that would be a really funny kind of moment to see. Um, uh, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It is, it's a little insane. Uh, I got to admit, but it, it was also just like, great as a, for me, like the process, it was just really fascinating. I love doing it. Yeah. Um, so you speak a lot to this relationship with, with depth in the work, but I feel there's also a relationship with surface as well. Um, can yeah. you speak to that a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. Actually you did. You mentioned like Trompe Loy and I love Trompe Loy painting. And for me, uh, I love I love the the whole notion within painting 
uh, as a sort of uh, thing to look at and engage with. And the, the tension of painting as object and then painting as illusion or, mm -hmm. or image is something that uh, sort of has like magic. And uh, so, so in one way, it's very much just an object. You can like touch it and feel it's just paint on the surface. But then in another way, it, it opens up. It's, it's the, a portal to this whatever it could be a portal to anything like uh, you can turn it into so many things and so i like um i like pushing the tension of that and i think lately in my the paintings i've been doing from photos recently i've been i've been challenging myself to paint as thickly as i possibly can while maintaining the image so like i uh one of these that come to mind is this painting I did of Katie's hand in 2019, uh, that the image, when you see the JPEG of the painting, it looks kind of like, I don't want to say photorealistic, but sort of, it sort of feels like really resolved. But when you see it in person, there's just so much paint. And I, I never touched the painting hardly ever without like a really loaded brush. And so for me, I like that tension. And there are a lot of painters that did this that are, I was, I, I still am in love with for very superficial reasons. And uh, that's like painters like John Singer Sargent. Oh my gosh, I cannot get enough of like, if there's a John Singer Sargent in a painting, I'm going to stare at it for at least like three minutes minimum, even if there are like I don't know, like El Greco's and Goya's or Velasquez paintings around or something, I will still stare at the sergeant, even though it's just a painting of some like rich person. Yeah. It's just the materiality of the painting and like how clever and how, how, uh, how he handled the material was just uh, fascinating to me. So as a student, when um, my, my professor that I, that I brought up, Sarah Jancy, I remember, um, her giving us this list of all these artists, uh, like a typical painting one assignment, you know, here's a list of 20 artists, you can pick one and write some sort of, or do a presentation on them. And I don't think I did a presentation on Sargent, but that was the very first time I was, sh I, I looked at Sargent's work because it was on the list. And then I got so obsessed, like, and I realized that the Art Institute, I live real close to Chicago. So I, I, I like made trips out there, pilgrimages, just to see certain paintings that I knew they had in the collection. Nice. <laughs> so, uh, so for me, I, I love that. But then, I mean, I, that, oh gosh, it's funny. I, I, I do feel like I'm a bit of an eclectic mess with my taste in painting because I also love Northern European painting. So, mm -hmm. um, like I got to see the Arnolfini wedding portrait, uh, 2018 or something. And holy crap, that painting in person. Mm -hmm. I was, uh, I was just like, com I was uh, like, yeah, I couldn't even do anything in front of it. I was just so amazed that he was able to do that at that time period. There's no photography. It, it just completely boggled my mind. I couldn't make sense of it. It was just the most insane, um, it, it, like the image itself too, just it, really potent. Like the way it was designed, the green of the dress is just like, it's just so, so uh, punchy. I, I love that word with color. I use it all the time, but it is really punchy. And the rest of the painting just like sits back. So I don't, I, I definitely have this relationship to, um, or this, this, uh, I, I like to imagine painting in those terms. Uh, Trump Loy paintings make a lot of sense, even though I, I feel like, um, historical Trump Loy paintings, some of them are interesting to me, like, uh, it's like Guy Sprecht's, uh, reverse of the painting. He painted the backside of a painting, mm -hmm. uh, that painting comes to mind and, uh, other, other ones like that. There are just a lot of really simple things like, oh, here's a, here's like our equivalent of a cork board. And I have things about my life tacked to yeah. it. I'm going to paint it, try to trick birds or something to, <laughs> to convince them it's going to be a real painting. I don't know. Maybe that's just how art historians talked about it, but I, I, um, I, I really love that idea of a shallow space in a painting. It's like a painting that only has like an inch of depth mm -hmm. to it. 
and then there being like moments where that just kind of like punches through and then you can see you know like a mile away or something yeah yeah through, through a window and so the the ability for a painting to have that that kind of um compressed space and if you can make an entire image out of that kind of compressed space is really cool yeah so definitely interested in trompe l'oeil so um one of the paintings you referred to i i think that came out of your summer painting project correct um, um which one the the one of your wife's hand oh uh i might have done some hand paintings in the summer paintings project but i think i did that painting earlier it wasn't part of that but oh, uh gotcha. yeah but i did i think i i don't know did i do a week of hand paintings i'm I know I did a couple, like I love paintings of hands. So <laughs> well, let's take a minute yeah. to, to talk about that. Cause I think it's such a, it was such an interesting project and it was something that I looked forward to seeing every day. Um, so if you wouldn't mind talking about that for a moment. Yeah. Yeah. It was, gosh, that was, <laughs> so last summer I just was like totally needed to decompress from the crazy transition from the middle of semester, it was like March, everything shut down. Mm -hmm. And then there was, it, it, we had to finish the semester, everyone who was teaching finished the semester out online. And uh, it was, and by the end of that, I was like, hey, I'm doing all of this online teaching stuff. I, uh, I'm learning how to do video, whatever. And so I'm like, I don't know, I'm just gonna do this project. And so I decided to do a project where I did a weekly theme and then made uh, five, yeah, five paintings every week. And then um, there was a, a project that I completely like ripped off 100%, just modeled it straight up off of that. And it's this uh, project, um, uh, our painted lives and maybe maybe some other people have seen it but i i was watching that and just loved the format of it and so i was like that sounds fun i'm gonna just do the same exact project and so i just filmed myself while painting whatever i was painting that week and then uh, i sped the i sped the video up of the painting unfolding and then i would just talk I really had zero plan going into those voiceovers. <laughs> I would just kind of like watch the video happening and then just sort of talk about what I was maybe thinking about when I was making the painting or um, whatever came to mind. Yeah. So it, it was, it was a really fun experiment, but honestly it was so exhausting because I realized how, as soon as I got into it, I was like, holy crap, this is going to take up so much time this summer. And so I would, you know, spend the morning making a painting and trying to jam it out in like three to four hours. And then in the evening, I would, you know, get all the footage dumped onto the computer and then try to <laughs> record a voiceover and get it all edited for the next day. It was just like so much work. I really could have used, you know, some other people helping me do it, but yeah. Yeah, I ended up, I was just like doing it all by myself. So it was so, it was crazy, but I, I love doing it. And for me, I, one of the reasons I did do it beyond just like seeing our painted lives and thinking, oh, this is really cool, um, was that I, I wanted to sort of, I don't know, like do a cleanse or a reset and just do really simple work that felt like I didn't overthink it. I wasn't um, doing some grand project, but it was just like, I'm going to make paintings of doorways this week, or I'm going to make some paintings of my girls, or I'm going to, you know, do some landscapes while I'm taking this trip at an Airbnb, like during COVID, <laughs> just try to like do something cool when, uh, you know, you can't really hang out with anyone. So, uh, yeah, that was, that was the project and that kind of where it came from. So how long does a, uh, a painting normally take for you um, in terms of your, your general studio practice, not necessarily the summer painting project, because those had a limited kind of lifespan, um, but yeah. your studio works. How, how long are you working on a painting? Um, and do you have multiple paintings going at one time? What's, what's happening in your studio? Yeah, I, I do work in groups. I would say I'll typically be working on about three at a time. 
uh, at least two. Uh, sometimes I'll just like get stuck on one and I, I just keep, you know, poking away, chipping away at it. <laughs> but uh, usually I have like a group going and especially for the color based paintings, because I was using a lot of the same colors, they're like repeating in compositions mm -hmm. or in painting. So uh, the materials I was using to build the little maquettes might have been the same exact materials for a few. And so if I'm mixing one color, and I know that color pops up in another painting, I'll just mix a ton of it. And then yeah. so I'm kind of going boom, 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 down the wall and painting them. So yeah, I would say, though, uh, how long they take, uh, I would the the shortest is usually like two sessions, uh, and that might be uh, for me. I don't know, like a four hour, five hour session in the studio, and then maybe like over two days, uh, I would jam out a painting. But a lot of times, like especially when they uh, some of these more recent paintings where I've been incorporating photography and images, those mm -hmm. uh, they could take up to like five or six sessions. So for me, like, yeah, studio days or whatever you'd say. Um, yeah, but I might be working on other yeah. ones at the same time. And how are you choosing the, the scale of these? Um, because I, I feel as though they're they're pretty close to your actual kind of building structure that you, that you set up to to actually make these paintings. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, they're always like one to one translations. I used to do a little bit more of this sort of, you know, proportional expanding of a scale. Like I'm looking at something smaller, I'm painting a little bit larger. And so it's relative expansion of size on everything. But uh, I've been doing just one-to-one -one painting for a while. Like I guess you call site size painting, but mm -hmm. doing it in a not quite traditional way, <laughs> but uh, it's still using the exact same old school one-to-one -one site size measurement system for me it just is a lot faster and uh yeah and i like being able to see what the painting will feel like standing in front of if i have the setup at that size already as i'm like looking at it and does it feel interesting at that scale but a lot of them have been small you know i 18 by 16 is a scale i've been working on a lot in the last two years so that's a yeah, I, I don't know. I like that scale. I like an upright, uh, like a por portrait orientation for me. Uh, it feels like an encounter of a torso, even if it's small. I, I kind of like that upright yeah. um, composition. And and when you're working, what is what is the atmosphere? Do you have podcasts going? Do you have Netflix? Do you have music yeah. blasting? What's, uh, what's happening there? Oh, gosh. Um... <laughs> It's a mix. I definitely like listening to audiobooks. So I'm on Audible, like listening to a lot of random things, sometimes uh, nonfiction, sometimes, uh, I don't know, I like listen to Brideshead Revisited recently, even Evelyn Waugh, um, that book. Uh, the, a lot of people might be familiar with the BBC documentary from the 80s that had... Uh, uh, Jeremy Irons, who was Scar and the Lion King. His voice is awesome. <laughs> yeah. I just love Jeremy Irons. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I, he, he read it. So I listened to him reading it, which was amazing because he was the, the actor, uh, one of the original cast members from that BBC documentary. But oh, wow. man, that book, that book's sweet. I love it. Um, but yeah, I, I listen to audiobooks a lot. Sometimes if I'm feeling tired, I will. I'll put on like stuff I listened to when I was a teenager. Like I still love the band MXPX yes. completely without any shame. Just love MXPX. I'll jam like one of my favorite albums of all time is slowly going the way of the Buffalo it came out in 1998. And it is just such a raw album. The drums in that album I love. Uh, yeah. It's just like, and they wrote that album when they were, I don't know, 19 or something. Mm -hmm. So 18, 19. So it's just full of this kind of weird, teenage angst, uh, sort of like spiritual, political, young person, angsty <laughs> energy music. So for me, I'll listen to that and uh, other crap like that, that just will get me going for a bit. And then I'll be like, Ugh. and then I'll put on some kind of like, I don't know, King's College uh, choral music or something, <laughs> them singing Palestrina. So I'm kind of all over the map. I, I actually really love 
I really love like English choral music. Uh, mm-hmm. I love um, Gregorian chant and whatnot. So I'll listen to that and I'll go to like punk music. So it just makes no sense. <laughs> yeah, I'm with That's you like, there. <laughs> Sometimes yeah. I'll, I'll be listening to, you know, early 2000s punk and then I'll, I'll oh, yeah. into like, <laughs> then I'll go into like sea shanties. And I'll listen to yeah. that for a little while. Oh yeah, man. <laughs> yeah, I've been learning the mandolin over the last couple of years. I've been, really? Uh, yeah, I've been playing a lot of traditional Irish music, which has nice. been really fun. Uh, which, which is a little bit of a weird instrument to learn that stuff on. It's, mm-hmm. It feels like a little bit more of a modern instrument in that repertoire, but that's been really fun. I, I've been doing that, and I love it. So, but that, that's so do. interesting. Yeah. Um. So. Yeah. I like to ask this question to everyone that I have on the show, um, but if there is one piece of art that you have to see in the world before you die, what is that one piece of art? Shoot. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man. Oh, one piece. I would honestly, I, I don't want to say a piece that I haven't seen. I was uh, like, I love, love Spanish painting. Mm -hmm. So I, I went to the Prado and gosh, that was 2010. Gosh, that was a long time ago, but I went to the Prado and I was only able to be there for one day. And I spent like the whole day there. They had to kick us out, you know, and that museum, I just saw so many pieces in that museum that I would love to go back and spend more time with. And so that's definitely like, uh, yeah, a trip that I want to do really soon especially after we can travel again. Right. But yeah, there's just so many pieces in that museum, like the Van der Weyden uh, deposition, the, um, gosh, like uh, Las Meninas, uh, there's the Garden of Earthly Delights, there's, uh, and the Velasquez Drinkers, the Bacchus painting. There's just yeah. like every room you go to, you're just like, what, how is this here? <laughs> it's just the, I think it was one of the most, magical days of my life for Mm -hmm. art viewing um so so yeah just a day in the prado uh i did get to see um el greco is one of my favorite painters and i saw his painting the burial of count orgas and um the entry of this little church in toledo that i i got to spend a good 45 minutes in front of and man that painting is just insanely awesome i just I, I, that's probably the painting I go back to the most and my, when I'm thinking about like paintings that have made a big impact on my life, uh, standing in front of that painting was probably one of them. And I so regret, uh, I was in Toledo and I had an opportunity to go into the Toledo cathedral and I, I didn't, and I don't know why I didn't, I like, I was with a group and they were like, oh, Caleb, you could go in, you can go into the cathedral. We'll like hang out over here at this like cafe or something. You can go. And I didn't, and I could have seen there, this, uh, the painting in the sacristy at the cathedral there. Mm. Um, the, the, um, what is it called? The, um, the disrobing, I believe the, the it's the Christ is wearing this like red robe and he's surrounded by all these people like kind of tearing at the robe, but that painting that's one that I'd like want to see in person, but I haven't. So that would be another one that I'd be like, man, I got to get back to Toledo, see that painting in person. And yeah. that would, that would be amazing. Yeah. Um, that's, that's great. I love that selection of work. Uh, just, a would, would you want to spend just one day in the Prado though? Or would you want to spend like, no, <laughs> I want to spend like a week. Yeah. I would be like, I'm going to Madrid to uh just spend at least like six days in a row of just returning to the prado and then like going for a walk to decompress and then the next morning doing the same thing you know go to the prado and then around like 4 p.m or something like going out for a walk and then going to some like tapas bar and staying up way too late and drinking lots of wine and what vermouth so that would be my like it's like an ideal day for me doing something like that that's then while I'm like at a it, magical time. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and then one of my other superheroes is uh, Antonio Lopez Garcia that mm-hmm. I would just like die to see. I, w- I would die to meet him. It would be be amazing to meet him in person to like see his studio and whatnot. So mm-hmm. um, I know he lives there. He's an old, really old guy now. I have a few friends who have met him and I'm just like, 
<laughs> be so cool to just i don't speak spanish though unfortunately so <laughs> that would that would be a little bit of a problem because i don't know if his english <laughs> yeah but i would still feel like i'm in front of this sort of to me he's like this monastic figure in painting mm -hmm. he just uh just lives painting and he's he doesn't seem to be chasing anything other than himself you know like he's in a studio just making yeah. things and so so for me it, it, i love him because for him for me he seems to be somebody who like knows who he's painting for and why he paints and he's he just has been doing it and it's like made this amazing uh body of work over the course of his life so he's somebody that i just really adore his work he's awesome yeah and then um, this is another question that I, I like to ask everyone. So uh, what is one piece of advice you have received over your career? And what is one piece of advice that you would like to pass on and share with an up and coming uh, generation of creatives? Mm. Gosh, um, say a piece of advice that I got that uh, is really practical advice, but I think about often and uh, it's uh, advice I got right when I was finishing up grad school, and it was Shangram uh, at Micah Shangram Majumdar that gave me this advice. He said uh, it was like after a semester of me being his TA, or at Micah, it's called the GTI. Uh, for those of you who aren't part of Micah culture, but their uh, graduate teaching internship with with Shangram, and it was a twelve hour long class. That was a super intense class. And at the end of the semester, I remember just like I don't know, going out for a drink after class or something and talking about um, living life as an artist. And this idea of um, not, not how to be successful necessarily, but how to just be an artist. And the advice he gave me was just, Caleb, don't ever stop painting just don't don't stop painting because if you stop that's when you lose your momentum and like most everyone i know who've who has continued painting is more or less doing pretty well because they just kept doing it and if you keep doing something and you're doing it um with i guess integrity or uh some some level of self criticism or something you're going to do it pretty well so he just said just don't stop painting and you'll you'll be fine and i i really took that to heart and uh thank you shangram if you ever listen to this thank you for telling me that because it was really good advice for me even when you know you hit dry spells and you feel like maybe you're not getting opportunities or or something but you're just like well it doesn't matter i'm going to keep working because i'm painting I'm I'm painting for myself. I'm not painting for anyone else, really. I'm, mm -hmm. uh, and I I love doing this. I love the process of painting, and this is an awesome way to live life. So so for me, just uh, that advice has kept me going at times where I was feeling down on myself or whatnot, and just just keep going. It doesn't matter. I really love painting, so just keep painting. Everything works out somehow. So yeah. That was really good advice. The second part, what did you say? <laughs> um, one piece of advice you'd like to pass on to an up and coming generation. Mm -hmm. mm. I would say, gosh, I, I definitely don't have any like sage single bit of advice, but one thing I think that is really helpful is knowing who you're painting for knowing who your audience is because that helps prioritize the decisions you make and mm. it might be you're painting to like get into a certain gallery and you want to make friends with all the people who show in that gallery or whatnot and you really love a certain kind of image building um community you could say and you totally invest in that. It might be you're you're painting for a certain like group of people that you 
uh, love and want to be a part of, or maybe you, uh, you're painting just for yourself. You don't really care so much about like a community, like, a hit my mic. Don't really care so much about like a community, or maybe you're painting for some like other thing, like spiritual reason. Maybe you're painting for God or, some, you know, whatever it is, knowing who you are painting for, I think, or who you're working for, what is your work about and for, I think is really good because, uh, when criticism comes or when, when uh, you hear things from maybe a group of people that you actually aren't working for, you sort of tell yourself that uh, maybe that doesn't, maybe I don't have to pay so much attention to that. And I, I think like, I don't know, most artists are sort of miserable with their own just internal thoughts about everything. They always are beating up on themselves. I'm definitely guilty of that. Same here that like, I don't need, I don't need other people to tell me how much I suck because I'm just <laughs> busy really telling myself I suck all the time. So if I can sort of focus who I care, who thinks I suck, uh, then it's a little bit uh, easier to keep going. So maybe that would be that, that. I don't know. Was that, did that make any sense? <laughs> that made perfect sense. I love it. Okay. I think that's great. Yeah. Um, so Caleb, I think that's kind of the perfect place to to wrap this up. So if our viewers are looking for your work, where might they be able to find it? Yeah, um, my website is calebcordercracks.com, C-A-L-E-B-K-O-R-T-O-K-R-A-X.com. So that's my website, uh, also on Instagram. Even though honestly, I've like completely just stopped posting on Instagram the last year. <laughs> so, I don't know why. I just like I've, the social. It, it wasn't intentional. After I did the the summer paintings project, I just was like, just kind of look at what other people do on Instagram. But I, I don't know. I, I some people are like, oh, you got to post every single day. I just don't care because. I don't know. <laughs> I just, uh, that's Sometimes not I'm it painting. becomes another job, you know, like yeah. having to post yeah. so much. I, I got in a, a bad spell with my own studio practice where I felt as though I was making work just to post. And I'm like, what am I doing? Yeah. There, there's no point. In yeah, um, totally. Uh, for me, I think I, I was finding myself feeling like a bit, you know, almost addicted to social media at times where I was like, man, I'm spending like upwards to like an hour to two hours some days just being on Instagram. And yeah. like, I could be doing some like really beautiful things with that time. And so I, I, uh, I set a limit on my phone at a certain point, maybe a year ago, just like I don't know, 20 minutes or something. I get that thing that pops up on your phone. Yeah. Sometimes I'm like, what? I'm like, no, I want to keep going. So I just ignore it. But, uh, you know, so for me, I'm like trying to do also, like I'm at a point in my life with uh, kiddos. I have a one-year-old and a four-year-old girl at home. And so I'm trying to be present as a dad and like really involved in their lives. So I uh, maybe, you know, once once they start becoming a little bit more independent, I'll start trying to get online a little bit more. But um, right now, yeah, it's been crazy. The last year I've been, I, I'm actually transitioning into a new studio right now. So I, I'm moving. So hopefully I'll be getting into work soon, but the last like two months has been like transition. So I haven't really been working, but I'm like yeah. dying to get into the studio and start painting. I, but, bet, uh, I bet. Yeah. I'm pumped. I'm so excited getting a new space. I, I've been in this room right here mm -hmm. since March of like <laughs> last year, <laughs> making, making work in this room. And it's been fine. It's great. Actually. Like I've, I've installed some like fluorescent lighting i don't have them all on but like lighting around the perimeter of the wall so this is like good lighting i can work in the space and i've been teaching out of this room it's an extra bedroom at home but i really i really like getting having that sort of transition going into the studio and mm -hmm. having a space yeah so anyways uh that that is all besides the point of where to find my work <laughs> but uh <laughs> yeah so my website and all that um Sorry, sorry for my whole uh, apology for not being online more, but <laughs> yeah. It's all good. It's brilliant. Well, Caleb, yeah. we can't wait to see what you do next. I'm a huge fan of your work, always have been. Um, thank you so much for being on the show. Um, guys, make sure you check out Caleb's work. If you haven't seen it yet, uh, go to his Instagram, go to his website, um, and I'll keep you posted to any shows that he has coming up in the future. Um, so Caleb, thank you for being on the show. And I will see you guys next week. All right. See ya. Thank you so much, Jeremy. 
See you all.